Dr. Raymond Fowler is a faculty member here of the Emergency Medicine Department. He's one of the most awarded EMS physicians in the country, and he's also one of the co-founders of the National Association of EMS Physicians. In his spare time, Dr. Fowler is a writer and quite the poet. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Fowler, whose talk today is entitled, Saving the Next 10,000. I want to try to get a hook in you and see if we can talk about something that will really get you energized. These two wonderful talks so far. I'm so humbled to be here, especially being a country boy, a redneck from Georgia. But I'm, I'm an emergency doc. I worked Parkland all night last night, which is why I look the way I do. Uh, I'm an EMS guy. Uh, I head up the, for Dr. Pepe, the uh, EMS systems for the city. So what we do is we scrape up the dead and the dying. We take care of the crack addicts with downtown Dallas. You know, the homeless guys, we're very tight. And we do resuscitation research. I'd like to talk to you a little about, about a certain problem. We'll talk for a bit about the history of cardiopulmonary resuscitation. We'll then speak for a moment about the Resuscitation Outcomes Consortium trial and then give you some thoughts for the future. We're talking today about cardiac arrest. A thousand times a day in the United States, someone's heart stops for some reason, principally an arrhythmic arrest where the heart suddenly gets uh, off kilter and it becomes a rapid and virtually inexorable movement toward death. The specter is enormous, ladies and gentlemen. 500,000 Americans drop dead every year. It's a very, very difficult problem, 1,000 a day. And this is a public health imperative because since the 1960s, we've created an emergency response system, paramedicine, if you will, which has emerged to try to manage this problem. Problem is, by the time we get on the scene, six, eight, 10, 12 minutes have passed, and the heart, which initially was in a an organized rhythm becomes chaotic, and instead of being a piston pump, it now is a flaccid uh, container that is no longer pumping blood. What is the problem? The problem is that tissues in the body are extremely susceptible to anoxia, to the lack of oxygen. And when we can get early cardiopulmonary resuscitation by citizens nearby, we get survivals in excess of 40%. But if some loved one or some person in the business uh, sector does not immediately rush and begin to do compressions, uh, survival is very, very poor. Now, what's that about? Take a deep breath right now. I need more from the Sopranos. Let's go. Here we go. Good. What is that? That's 150 millimeters of mercury. You can breathe now. P partial pressure, partial pressure of oxygen, oxygen that you've just inhaled. The purpose of the upper mucosa is to uh, make it humid, so by the time that the oxygen gets down into your lungs, it's about 100 millimeters of mercury. You'll see where I'm going in a second. Once it crosses the alveolar capillary membrane, uh, you have between 80 and 100 millimeters of mercury of oxygen in your vascular system. By the time it gets down to the tissue, most people don't know this. There's actually 40 millimeters of mercury. Look at your fingertips. That's 40 millimeters of mercury. The fact that you're looking at your fingertips really makes me happy. Uh, <laughs> Um, 40 millimeters of mercury out there. Now, why does it matter? It matters because tissue damage begins at under 10 millimeters of mercury. What does that have to do? There's a pool of oxygen in the body. It's in the tissues, and it's about a quart. It's about 1,000 cc's. Moreover, right as I stand here right now with my enlarging obesity, I have five liters of blood in my vascular system with 20 cc's of oxygen per 100 cc's of blood. Well, if I, if I divide that 100 into the 5,000, I have a multiplication factor of 50, 20 times 50. There's a quart of oxygen on my red blood cells. What's that about? So in addition to the tissues, there's a quart of oxygen on the red cells. What does that mean? That's 2,000 cc's, two quarts. There's a thing called the Fick equation. I don't want to really put you to sleep after these wonderful talks you've heard. But it's the, it's the volume of consumption of oxygen. What does that mean? It means that as you're sitting there right now, I brought a show and tell thing, all the way from Starbucks, our bodies consume this much, one cup of oxygen, as you're dig digesting your breakfast right now, a cup of oxygen per minute. Well, you have 2,000 cc's. You have two quarts. So with a well-oxygenated patient at the time of arrest, there are a total of two quarts of oxygen in the body that we can get at. If we can just move the blood around, the patient has enough oxygen in the body to live for as long as eight minutes. This has only been recognized in the last couple of years. If you took CPR training four or five years ago, we didn't know that. I've been doing CPR training for over 30 years. We've learned so much. We've learned that the aorta that comes off the left ventricle is very much like the inner tube of a tire. And if you imagine taking that inner tube and blowing it up with that there pump there and putting a tack into it, it makes that noise and it leaks. But you can keep up with that thumbtack hole in the, in the inner tube, right? We doing okay so far? 
I do what, when I speak, I do what's called a uvula count, you know, the little hanging down thing, and I see people going, <sighs> I'm going, well, let's see, okay. So the point is, you can keep up with that. Now, why does that matter? Because this is the inner tube coming across off the left ventricle. That, what that is about is that the left ventricle keeps the aorta, which leaks constantly into the periphery, it keeps it full and distended. Why does that matter? Because the way the Lord made us in her wisdom is that the first two blood vessels that come off the aorta, that was a Texas joke, the first... <laughs> Two blood vessels that come off the aorta are the coronary arteries. We supply our heart muscle first. What's this all about? How to address this? In 1960, Peter Safford, Jim Jude, uh, Bill Kabenhoven, and Guy Knickerbocker invented cardiopulmonary resuscitation. It took them years of effort to be able to do that. What came of it? They found that by compressing on the chest, you could actually move blood forward. This was not known until around 1960. Moreover, they invented the first defibrillator. This thing was a monster. 400 joules, uh, AC current, and weighed 200 pounds. But what's it about? Fast forward 50 years. The 50th anniversary of cardiopulmonary resuscitation was in December, actually September of 2010. In December of 2010, the American Heart Association and others got together to celebrate the creation of cardiopulmonary resuscitation, which had saved thousands of lives. Fast forward for a second and think about this. A disease whose presenting symptom is <coughs> dead, Thousands of these people have gone home. Why is this important? This is Guy Knickerbocker, and this is Jim Jude in their 80s now, 50 years later. And to this banquet, they invited 50 survivors of cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Get your handkerchiefs ready. This young lady, at the age of two, fell into a pool face down, suffered, she drowned, suffered immersion injury. It's politically correct. CPR was done. She was resuscitated. Uh, this young lady, eight years old, uh, actually suffered an arrhythmia. She had hokum, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, and actually had a cardiac arrest. She was defibrillated, CPR was done, and she survived. And you talk about a tearjerker. These two little girls came up with the roses and handed them, here is the scene, to Guy Knickerbocker and Jim Jude and said, thank you. Now, I mean, come on. Is that, <laughs> that's really cool. What have we come to understand? We have come to understand that we have a public health imperative. <clears throat> and we're inviting you to come participate here at UT Southwestern in a public health imperative. Part of what we're doing is the Resuscitation Outcomes Consortium. This is the largest research trial in history, sponsored, among others, by the National Institutes of Health, with these 11 areas around the United States in, United States in which we look at hemorrhagic shock due to trauma, traumatic brain injury, and cardiopulmonary resuscitation. You may or may not know, if you have a history in um, EMS, for example, that the monitored defibrillators that we use, when you turn them on, they start to record. When you turn them off, they archive the file, think MP3, except it's not an MP3. And you can open the file, and you can see every ventilation that was given by the paramedics. You can see every compression that was done by the paramedics. And we can take these things, and we can actually plot them. And what did we found? We looked at outcome together with how many seconds out of the minute did they do compressions on the chest. Look at what we found. This is zero seconds. This is 60 seconds out of every minute. This is percent survival. Look at this. Up at about, we have to get to about 40 seconds out of every minute of doing compressions to optimize survival. This is our public health imperative. This is our challenge, and this is what we're working on here at UT Southwestern. When we started opening these files, we found, look at minute three. No compre the red lines were compressions. No compressions, no compressions. Remember the leaking aorta coming off the left ventricle? Remember that? And we have to pump it up and keep it going? This is dead heart muscle by this time. This is what's going on in many places around the country now. And what we've got to do is address this because we can't be here. Now we're here. And look at these wonderful compressions that we're doing. Uh, and by doing so, in this municipality, in the city of Dallas since 2008, guess what? We have improved our survival by 100%. We, per year, we're sending home dozens more people. It is a team effort. It involves 25 EMS systems in cities around the area, but we're doing it together as partners here at UT Southwestern. We're so proud of this. The problem is some people get really, really energized. They're, they're trained to a rate of 100. <laughs> Check this out, 200, 201, 214. Folks, that's four per second. <laughs> That's, that's grooving, folks, I'm telling you. And we now have hard data. We have looked at rate of compressions. We, We've looked at rate of compressions versus survival. Are you with me? Y'all focus on this point. What did I do? Did I do something wrong? Okay. Is my, no. Uh, we've looked at rate. <laughs> we've looked at rate of compressions versus survival. And what have we found? That the rate has to be very carefully controlled between 100 and 120. And we found that most, most people don't do that. What's the problem? So we have all these fast compressions going on here. 
And what have, we, what have we been doing? We've been saying, well, you just need to sing that song, Stayin' Alive, Stayin' Alive. You heard that before, right? Let me tell you, Aunt Minnie doesn't know that song. Aunt Minnie, who's 60 years old and needs to do CPR on Uncle Herman, has never heard the song, Stayin' Alive. She wouldn't recognize the Bee Gees if they ran over her in a pickup truck. Actually, the, I think the Bee Gees are all dead now, so they probably would not run over her in a pickup truck. What we know is compression rate matters. And therefore, I want you to each take your hands. We're going to do CPR training. I'll sign your cards after. We'll put your hands in front of you right now, and we're going to press and sing together, row your boat. I know it's silly, but, but this is unpublished data. Scientific research is going to be published in a couple of months, and you need to go home and tell 10 people because you will save a life if you do that. Ready? Go. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 life is but... Stop singing and observe yourself. Stop singing and observe yourself. That's the correct rate of compressions. It doesn't come naturally. This is why we're putting metronomes on monitors in the field, for example. This is very important. Go, ten go tell 10 people, and somebody in this room will save a life. The Fick equation, remember, a cup of oxygen per minute, we have six to eight minutes of oxygen in our, in our bodies, and unless it was a drowning like that little girl, or it's what we call a cafe coronary, where a piece of meat gets stuck in someone's throat, th th those are anoxic arrests. There's not enough oxygen around. Everybody else you can ignore the airway for about five minutes. Why? Because everybody that's looked at the reluctance to do CPR has said, I ain't putting my mouth on that vomit cover, stranger. So they, don't, so they don't do compressions at all. But now we know getting on the chest matters. So what I'm telling you then is get on the chest, stay on the chest, keep pumping. Somebody find an automated external defibrillator, and for goodness sakes, call 911 early. What you may or may not know is there, there's now a thing called therapeutic hypothermia. Because people who get a pulse back after cardiac arrest who don't wake right up, we take them to the hospital and we cool them for up to four days. And we are seeing astounding results. We're seeing people wake up and go home and rejoin their families that never would have before. So what is the next 10,000? A.J. Heitman, who's the editor of the Journal of Emergency Medical Services, said this, and I think it's just wonderful. Read, read with me. He says, it's my dream that we would give a $100 bonus to the first person on the chest in a cardiac arrest. Now, I'm an EMS guy. I can see it now. Medics go out there and says, who was the first dog? Me, me, not me. Okay, you. Okay, I'm giving you. Just mail this in and uh, Obama will send you a check. And uh, uh, No, really, he told me this. And, and so I'm trying to be a scientist here. I said, okay, look, there's half a million arrests a year. Let's say that this deal works and gets 100 more thousand people on the chest, right? And we're going to send them each a uh, $100 bill, right? So that is $10 million per year. And let's say that we're 10% successful of returning people to their home. Average age of cardiac arrest here, which is a very tender thing to me, pushing Medicare age, is about 55 in this community. And so let's say these taxpayers then pay, let's say 10,000 people survive of this, paying $100,000 a piece for the remainder of their lives in taxes. That is a billion dollars. Ladies and gentlemen, if there is an investor in you, 10 million makes a billion. That's 10,000% return on investment. <laughs> Call your congressman today. <laughs> If they won't listen to that, what will they listen to? So imagine the impact. <laughs> On this nation, if we could save 10,000 lives a year, we lose 37,000 people a year in motor vehicle accidents in this country. We could save as many as a third of that many just by getting people to get on the chest. Um, the, the seventh grade of schools, and what we'll do is we'll teach them all in health class, simply the row, row your boat, and they've got to go home and each tell 10 people and bring the names back. That's your homework assignment for the next week. <clears throat> Does it work? You bet. This, this occurred last year, a nine-year-old boy. The deal was, was that uh, the family goes walking outside and sees the two-year-old floating face down in the pool. And while the mother and the grandmother are running around in circles screaming the bloody murder, the uh, nine-year-old calmly gets in the pool, pulls the girl out, does CPR on the little girl. When asked, son, by this reporter, where did you learn to do that? He says, I saw it on TV. <laughs> so the vision then for the future is that all that can be prepared would be that all of us who might give care sing as a well-rehearsed choir from the same sheets of music and that research will light our paths as we maintain our commitment to the betterment of the human condition. Come to UT Southwestern and join us. Be part of this wonderful adventure as we look to a magnificent and yet uncharted future. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. <laughs>